Hello, it's Scott Manley here. In the 1980s, the US set about developing its space station, the Freedom Space Station, revealed to the world in 1984. Eventually, over decades, it would evolve into the ISS. But even in the 1980s, it was very much an international project. The US had managed to get buy-in from Japan and Europe, who were going to provide their own uh, laboratory modules, and of course Canada, who were going to provide a robotic manipulator system. But by the early 1990s, with the Soviet Union opening up, there were efforts to bring the Soviet Union space program together with NASA. In July of 1991, President George H.W. Bush and uh, Mikhail Gorbachev signed an agreement to allow a US astronaut to fly to Mir and to allow a Soviet cosmonaut to fly on board the space shuttle. But I believe the first suggestion that Russian hardware could go on the space station was in December of 1991, days before the collapse of the Soviet Union. Congress directed NASA to investigate using a Soyuz as a lifeboat on the space station for the assured crew return vehicle. The space shuttle was supposed to be the main crew transportation system for the space station. However, the space shuttle can only remain on orbit for less than a month, after which it has to return to Earth. So if the space station was going to be occupied permanently, they needed some way to return crew from the station if there wasn't a space shuttle docked. Hence, the assured crew return vehicle. And they studied a lot of different options for this. They looked at capsules, they looked at uh, space planes, lifting bodies, uh, they looked at capsules flying under power wings to runways. And the studies also looked at growth options for this vehicle, giving the vehicle bigger engines and manipulator arms and sending the crew out on errands to go and repair satellites. They looked at travelling up to geostationary orbit to sat service satellites up there and envisage the same basic design as being useful for a moon mission or even a Mars mission. But with the price tag of the station rising, having an already functioning return vehicle in the form of the Soyuz must have seemed like a pretty attractive option. NASA had previously worked with the Soyuz for the Apollo-Soyuz test project in the 1970s. Since then, the design had changed somewhat, it had become the Soyuz TM, and to make it work with the space station, they would need to make a number of hardware changes to make it uh, have the endurance that was required because there were concerns about the peroxide uh, propulsion system, there were some concerns over battery life, the Soyuz-style docking hardware would be replaced by the Freedom Common berthing mechanism. The control panels would all be swapped over to English because unlike the current Soyuz flights, this would be a hardware that was basically being bought by NASA for operation by US station crew. There were also concerns expressed over the accommodation for the astronauts. First of all, it was a little too small, about 95% uh, of astronauts could fit inside, but that left 5% who would not be able to go to the space station and stay there. And since this was a vehicle that was supposed to return in an emergency, crew members might be injured, which means they may not be able to put on the so-called spacesuits. But the manufacturer insisted that the problem had been solved and there would be no repeat of the depressurization incident that killed three cosmonauts. No, the biggest technical problem was going to come from orbital mechanics. Space Station Freedom was going to be launched by the Space Shuttle. It was put in an orbit that had a 28.5 degree inclination. That's the same latitude as the launch site in Florida. The Soyuz would normally launch from Baikonur, which is a latitude of 46 degrees. And because they don't want to drop hardware on China, they actually, the lowest inclination available is 51.6, which is the inclination used by today's space station. This made it impossible for the standard Soyuz launch vehicle to reach the space station. Now, they did talk about establishing a Soyuz launch facility closer to the equator, and that did actually happen under Ariane space, but that is the cargo version of the Soyuz, and of course it did happen you know, a couple of decades too late. They also thought it might have been possible to place on uh, existing expendable launch vehicles, but the Delta II didn't have the payload, the Atlas II is marginal, the Titan 3C would be very, very expensive. 
No, what they really wanted to do was put it in the space shuttle's payload bay. In fact, they thought they might be able to fit two of these Soyuz spacecraft inside the space shuttle payload bay and launch them to the uh, station in a single launch. Given that the base crew of the station was supposed to be four during early years, they would need a minimum of two anyway, and three when the space station was completed and fully staffed. Carrying the Soyuz on the space station was also considered preferable because it would mean that the Soyuz wouldn't have to fire up its engines or do anything. It would just be taken to the station, pulled out with the manipulator arm and berthed to the station in the you know escape pod location. It was also anticipated that since the Soyuz had a limited on-orbit life, they could be returned to Earth using the space shuttle as well for servicing, for refurbishment. But also returning to Earth under its own power, that would have its own problems. Because the space station was in this 28.5 degree orbit, it could only land between 28.5 degrees north and south of the equator. While the Mercury, Gemini and Apollo spacecraft had all touched down in the ocean, the Soyuz was designed to be landed on land. And the standard landing sites in Kazakhstan were too far north for this planned orbit. The only areas of the US the Soyuz would be able to reach would be the southern parts of Florida, Texas, and of course the state of Hawaii. But the Soyuz also needs to touch down on flat, featureless terrain. And this is made harder by the fact that its landing accuracy is only within 30 kilometers of the target. Its landing accuracy is particularly bad because it opens its parachute at a much higher altitude than the Apollo capsules. The reason it did this is because it uses a single parachute with a possible reserve. So this capsule has to have time to figure out whether it needs to deploy the reserve. Whereas with Apollo, they deployed their parachutes at much lower altitudes, but they deployed three of them simultaneously. So there wasn't any real way to improve the accuracy such that they could land safely in any of the US states. So NASA started looking around the world, and they looked at Australia. Australia had large areas of land which were nice and flat, and NASA even sent a group of uh, people down there to investigate the terrain and talk with the local search and rescue teams to make sure that they would be able to handle a capsule returning from space with potentially injured astronauts. The report analysing this was published only a few months after the end of the Soviet Union. It was a startling turnaround, but of course that isn't what happened. What happened was the politics became somewhat untenable. This Freedom Station was looking to be too expensive, and it was almost cancelled by the House of Representatives. It came within one vote of being cancelled. Uh, Bill Clinton asked for reassessment for cheaper alternatives and they came up with Space Station Alpha. He actually had three options, but he picked option A, which still allowed the other partners to be involved. The new station was intended to be in a 51.6 degree orbit so that Russian launch vehicles to access it. And from there, the collaboration opportunities grew until the Russian Mir-2 project was merged into the Alpha project to get the ISS. And the Zvezda service module was originally being built for the Mir-2 project, but it became one of the core parts of the International Space Station. And of course, the government was much more accommodating of this new arrangement because it was no longer just a fancy space project. It was now something that was adding stability to national security. It was giving jobs to former Soviet rocket and space scientists to make sure they didn't get tempted to go off and do other things that might be less useful to the US's interests. And of course, during the construction of the space station, the space shuttle did eventually end up carrying Russian-designed hardware in its payload bay. The Rosvet module was launched in 2010 by the space shuttle Atlantis, and it was one of the last major modules added to the space station. There was also a project to build an emergency crew return vehicle for the International Space Station. This actually flew in the form of the X-38, but it never made it to space, and ultimately the program was cancelled in 2002. 
Instead, the US contracted with Energia to create an improved version of the Soyuz in the form of the Soyuz TMA that would finally be able to incorporate all the different sizes of astronauts that were allowed in the US space program. And that's how we got to what we have today. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.